Anyway, my name is Kim Presnell. Welcome, welcome to your first lecture here in engineering. It's my privilege as chair of first year to uh, actually begin the proceedings. And um, actually, it's my honor to be here. I'm responsible for all of first year, and I want you to know that I'm committed to seeing that you receive the best possible uh, first year engineering education and experience that we can provide. Yes. I'm very proud of the fact that you picked us and you should also feel very proud because you were picked from among about 10,000 applicants. So you should actually feel very special. Congratulations. <laughs> We're going to hear a few inspiring words this morning, some from my boss and, and some from a, a graduate who seems very recent to me. But the wonderful thing is there'll be a common thread, and the common thread as you go through engineering will be, engineering is a foundation degree. It provides many paths, and it leads to many doors. And I could list many, but I'll say medicine, law, business, research, academia, and in the end, you will probably be tested and thought, well, I don't know exactly what it is I want to do. And my encouragement to you is don't worry. Follow your heart. Find joy in the work that you do, because if you do find joy in the work that you do, you'll discover something very special. You'll find that it's a lot easier to do well. And when you do well, people will actually pay you to do the work. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, I, I, I also have to remind you that uh, there's some special things you might consider in engineering, and that is working hard. Um, I call it at least the three P's for success, patience, persistence, and perseverance. Uh, it's not going to be an easy four years, but you can do it. While you're here, though, I want to encourage you to actually savor your school years. You don't know it, but for most of you, these are relatively carefree days. And you go, really? This doesn't seem very carefree to me. They are. They're a wonderful time in your life. And, and you should find joy in what you do here, and we'll help you. If you need help, we're here to help you. I quipped about this at the parents' meeting on Thursday night. My door is always open. But the problem is, you don't know where my door is. <laughs> and I will tell you, it's at 44 St. George Street, and you're always welcome. But we also have a first-year office, and they're dedicated to your success. And I want to tell you this, just to reassure you, 90% of you will move on, and you will succeed in engineering. Some of you may decide engineering isn't for me and you'll go elsewhere and you'll become very famous. Like one of our previous presidents who always reminded the class that he left engineering after first year when he realized it wasn't him. But that 90% statistic we're very proud of. It means if you've got the academic ability and shown the potential to get here, then you can do it. It's a matter of putting it together with hard work. Uh, I really look forward to, and you'll hear this again and again, forward to seeing you here in four or five years' time. And this is Convocation Hall, this is where you'll receive your degree, and this is where you will make your parents very proud. In the end, the wonderful thing is that, as you've always strived to make your family and friends very proud, I encourage you, as you do great achievements, to think about the people that follow you and make them proud of your good works too. Um, those are all my words of inspiration and my welcome this morning. I wish you well in your studies, and as I said, and it is sincere, my door is always open, and yes, it's at 44 St. George, and you might have to get past a few administrative people in order to get to me, but I'm happy to help you. But there are many people here that are happy to help you. All your professors, all your tutors, they're all here to help you and we want to see you succeed. So with that, it's my honor to introduce to you uh, my boss and also your boss. She's actually Dean of our faculty, Christina Hamon. Christina. Uh, thank you, Professor Presnell. And once again, good morning and welcome to the engineering class of 1D6. I'm going to reinforce some of the words that Professor Presnell just said, but I'd like to start with a warm welcome from all of us on behalf of the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. 
I also want to welcome Anthony Lacavera, Chairman and CEO of Wing Mobile, and also a 1997 graduate of Computer Engineering, who will be giving today the plenary lecture. I'll say a few words more about him in just a moment. But first to you, students. Today, you begin a journey, a journey not without its challenges, but you didn't decide to study engineering because you thought it might be easy. You came here seeking a challenge. And you, of all students who have come to U of T engineering, are up to that challenge. You are the strongest in our history, with a collective entering average of 91.3%. Congratulations. You were chosen from a pool in which there was one place for every 13 applications. We have chosen each and every one of you because you do have what it takes to succeed in this challenging environment. And you were not chosen only for academics, but you were also chosen because you will contribute to your class, to our community, and I believe to U of T engineering legacy. You are also a diverse class. Like me, over one quarter of you join us from another country. You come from 53 countries, representing all continents, and from eight Canadian provinces. I am thrilled that diversity is also reflected through the number of female students who make up over 25% of the class of 1T6. You have earned the right to be a student at U of T Engineering. <laughs> and now, you are part of a privileged group of U of T engineering community destined to stand alongside our 42,000 alumni who live and work all over the world and who have achieved great achievements. Supporting you on this journey you are about to begin will be our faculty. Our professors have a genuine passion for engineering, for education and for research that we want to share with you. Also supporting you here are the engineering staff members. Whether you have questions about courses, financial aids or computing, or you need somebody to talk to, we are always available to help. Look around you, look at the person next to you, look at who is behind you and in front of you. These are your classmates. Learn from each other, support one another, have fun together. The next time that I will talk to you all together in this convocation hall, will be at your graduation. Keep sight of that goal. Picture yourself sitting in this magnificent hall, wearing your academic robe, with your family and friends proudly watching you as you graduate from the number one engineering school in Canada, and I believe soon to be the best in the world. Your potential is boundless, 
and we don't need to look any farther than today's plenary speaker, Anthony Lacavera, to see that it is true. As I mentioned, Tony is our alum, a 1987 graduate from computer engineering, and currently he's chairman and CEO of Global Life Communications and Wind Mobile. He's a Canadian-born telecom entrepreneur, having founded Global Life in 1998, just one year after he graduated from U of T Engineering, and then co-founded Wind Mobile in 2008. In 2010, Tony was named CEO of the year by the Globe and Mail's report on Business Magazine, and he was named one of Canada's top 40 under 40 in 2006. Under his leadership, Global Life has received numerous awards, the best in the business awards, including ranking number one on Profit Magazine's 2004 list of Canada's 100 fastest growing companies. Also, one of Canada's 50 best managed companies for seven consecutive years, and twice listed as one of Canada's 30 best workplaces. Like you here today, Tony is the best among the best. In 2007, Tony founded the Shamba Foundation, a unique charity that assists other charities with fundraising and organizational efforts. He's also a pilot and enjoys flying for both work and leisure. Please join me in welcoming our 2012 plenary speaker, Mr. Anthony Lacavera. so long ago. Uh, this morning though, I was just strolling leisurely <laughs> through the campus, not having to worry about taking any notes or taking any, uh, any stress about tests or exams coming up. And it was uh, Jim Dawson that actually saw me strolling casually and saying, you've got to speak in five minutes, you've got to get in there. <laughs> Today is the first time that the, speak the, the lecture will wait for me. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Dean Amon for the invitation to speak with you all this morning. Uh, it is really my pleasure to speak with you, and uh, scanning this room, I know I see many of the future leaders of our great country. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself today, my story as a, both a social and a for-profit entrepreneur. Uh, I'm going to share with, my, with you my biggest successes and my biggest mistakes. I'm privileged to have started, financed, and exited a wide range of a uh, number of businesses and been involved in a number of social enterprises. I've developed partnerships and business relationships around the world, and I've faced unprecedented legal and regulatory challenges here at home in my effort to launch Canada's first independent wireless carrier in over a decade, Wind Mobile. Are there any Wind customers in the audience? Thank you very much for your business and your support. <laughs> My story, as Dean Amon said, is living proof that anyone can achieve the goals they set for themselves if they aim high and chase their dreams relentlessly. 
My parents like to say that they knew I was going to be an engineer from a very young age. As a kid, I always enjoyed building things, especially bridges and steps over the neighbor's fence. <laughs> After several attempts, failed attempts, to get over the fence, my mother banned me from building bridges or steps of any kind. To an industrious six-year-old future engineer, that was just a challenge to find another way to slip to the neighbor's yard. I finally made it as a seven-year-old by digging a trench under the fence. <laughs> and that's when my mom said, our son's going to be an engineer. <laughs> so how did a regular kid growing up in a small town of Welland, Ontario, with no particular advantages, build a company that now competes directly and successfully with three of the most powerful and largest companies in our country, being the big three wireless carriers, Rogers, Bell, and Telus. How did Global Ed develop from inception as a startup with no revenues, no unique IP, no capital, no track record, and no connections to become an award-winning company with an industry-leading team, all working towards our goal of making Canada's telecommunications industry more globally competitive. The answer, which we will discuss today, may seem surprisingly simple. Surprisingly simple, and perhaps unfortunately, somewhat like a cliche. It really is a story of humility, of perseverance, of discipline, and good, old-fashioned, hard, consistent work. I'm very proud to have attended the University of Toronto, and certainly the engineering school at the University of Toronto prepared me very well for my career as an entrepreneur. The problem-solving skills I acquired in engineering school, I still apply every single day against all of the challenges and opportunities I encounter. The community of friends and colleagues I developed at the UT Engineering and during my time living at St. Mike's I still count among my closest friends and colleagues. In fact, many of them still work with me today at the Global Ed Group. Recently, I came across an interesting quote about the engineering profession, attributed to British scientist Sir Eric Ashby. Engineers require the imagination to visualize the needs of society and to appreciate what is possible as well as the technological and broad social age understanding to bring his or her vision to reality. What struck me about this quote was the notion that engineers are asked to turn the impossible into the possible. It's the kind of challenge we live for as engineers. I'm sure the words, it can't be done, is all that it takes to get all of you motivated. The same is true of entrepreneurs. The entrepreneurial spirit is something that I've had my entire life. By the time I arrived here at U of T, I, my mind was pretty well made up that I would not do well at all reporting 9 to 5 into a bureaucratic construct. So what is an entrepreneur? I believe that entrepreneurship is much more about taking risks, much more than about taking risks and starting a business. Much more than that. In my mind, entrepreneurship is a state of being where one questions the way things are and how they can be made better. This applies in all work settings, from social enterprises, the charitable ventures and causes, the public sector, and big and small enterprise. Entrepreneurship is a sustained and relentless pursuit of an identified set of goals towards achieving a dream of the way things could be and having the conviction that things will be as one envisions. Some of us know that we make our own circumstances, and each one of us builds our own reality in whatever walk of life one wishes to pursue. Those that know this are entrepreneurs. If anyone in this room believes they have an idea that can change the world, you may very well be right but the idea is meaningless without the drive of the entrepreneurial spirit to develop the idea and the drive to pursue it with every breath, every minute.
a bit about myself. So I was born in Welland, Ontario, and I went to Notre Dame Catholic High School. I played uh, junior B hockey for the Welland Flames. I was a third liner, although I told the girls in my class I was a first liner. <laughs> I generally got pretty good grades, but I was one of the people that had to work hard to, to get good grades. I went to Switzerland for a semester before engineering school to learn how to speak French. And after I moved to Toronto to attend the engineering school in class of 1997 in the ECE department, really dating myself here. That's almost uh, 15, well, I guess 15 more, 20 years ago almost. Uh, I, uh, I lived at St. Mike's in, in residence. After graduating in 97, as Dean Amon said, I found it global live in 1998. A big part of my life is the Shamba Foundation, which I founded in 2007. It is a charity that supports small charities. With the goal of helping small charities raise funds for their causes at no cost to the charity. In Canada, we have a, an epidemic problem of small charities being underfunded and poorly organized. We donate our fantastic Shamba Space fundraiser venue. We staff fundraisers with volunteers from the Global Live Group teams. And we work to source food and drink sponsors for fundraisers wherever possible so that charities can put all of the money raised towards their respective causes. I also spend a lot of my time helping young entrepreneurs, or younger entrepreneurs, I still like to think of myself as a young entrepreneur, <laughs> uh, with, with programs such as the Next 36, and I regularly speak to young entrepreneurs about the lessons that I've learned, and I always know that if I was in your chair today, I would love to hear what people like myself have to say about entrepreneurship, social and private sector entrepreneurship, public sector entrepreneurship, because we have a lot of mistakes and a lot of battle scars. Personally, I always, I've always enjoyed running, and uh, I still run around Queen's Park when I have the opportunity, and uh, as Dean Amon said, I'm a pilot, so I really enjoy flying for fun and, and business. My first business experience was during my second year at U of T. At the time, laptops and tablets were not practical or common, and everyone took handwritten lecture notes complete with manually drawn diagrams. I had a classmate, Johnny Crada, who still works with Global Live today as our CTO, that had by far the neatest and most complete handwritten notes and diagrams of anyone in any of the engineering classes. So Johnny and I started our first business together. I started a business photocopying, packaging, and selling what became the famous Johnny's Notes. <laughs> we set up shop in the ECE common room. There was a photocopy shop across the street, across College Street, where I did a, a deal to get the lowest cost so no one could make a cheaper copy of my copies. And we got into business. My biggest achievement in that business, which I'll never forget, was the day Johnny and I were sitting in the ECE common room and Professor Gulak came in. And we thought we were in big trouble for running a business at the ECE common room. And he said, I understand someone here has the best and most complete and neatest notes of my lectures in my course. And he bought the notes for his own course. <laughs> <laughs> I kept that $20. I still have that $20 today. So how did Global Life start? In 1998, the Canadian and Radio and Telecommunications Commission deregulated the local phone market in Canada. And Global Life started as what was known as a long distance reseller. In the late 1990s, almost 15 years ago, long distance still cost as much as a dollar a minute to call from Toronto to Vancouver. Hard to believe in the days of Skype and VoIP. A group of us that had met at the University of Toronto Engineering School got together in 1998 to develop software that would enable us to offer our services at a much lower cost than the big three big four phone companies. We took advantage of the new regulations, fostering competition in the local phone market, and started selling long distance services to hotels and hospitals. We also started selling our software to the newly emerging local competitive phone companies that were emerging in Canada under the new regulations. This is when I learned the benefit of prototyping and proof of concept, in fact, by accident. We had successfully sold a contract to a newly emerging competitive phone company but we had not yet developed any of the software we needed to service the customer. Out of inexperience, and frankly at the time out of necessity, we showed them the solution in pieces as we had developed it. What wound up happening is through their feedback, we improved our product 
sufficiently that we had a much more compelling proposition for subsequent customers. Since that day, we at Globalize have prototyped our software solutions and rolled them out to market as fast as possible. It's the thing that still today makes companies that we've started, such as Wind Mobile, the fastest moving in our industries. I can remember us meeting representatives from Bell Canada and the other big phone companies and being dismissed completely as kids with no idea what we were doing. No experience, no track record, no clue. We were encouraged to reconsider our business plan by one Bell representative because it was doomed for failure. Another did not understand why anyone could possibly think we could compete with the big phone companies in Canada. The more things change, the more they stay the same. After a 10-year track record, I still received the same feedback in 2008 when I founded WinMobile. But more than that in a few minutes. In 2000, when the market for technology co and telecom companies collapsed, 11 of our 12 largest carrier customers went bankrupt and abruptly stopped paying their bills. As a young company with no credit, we quickly were pushed to the brink of insolvency when our suppliers were demanding payment and we could not collect from our now defunct customers. And this is when I got my first big hard lesson in business. The importance of diversification. A simple concept, but it kills so many companies. Never rely too much on any one customer or one revenue stream for your business or your social enterprise to be successful. From 2000 to 2006, we worked on growing our business. We focused on niche markets that the big phone companies largely ignored. We were the first company to launch automated teleconferencing service in Canada in 2000 using our software, and we were the first to launch VOIP services, voice over IP services for business in 2003. I'm so proud. I'm so proud of the incredible community of people that we've built over the years, including several of whom I met this day in 1993 when I came to my first lecture in engineering. I'm really proud of all the awards that Global Ed has won. Dean Amon listed some of them, so I'm not going to boast to you any further. But it really is about the community of people that built our company. And those people, many of them leaders in that company, that company were people I met here. In late 2007, the federal government announced it was opening the 2008 Wireless Spectrum Auction to new entrant wireless companies. We saw this as our big opportunity to enter the wireless industry to stop competing only in small niche markets that the big guys didn't care about and start going head to head with the big three wireless companies. At the time, the Canadian wireless industry was one of the least competitive in the world, with the highest prices in the OECD and the lowest penetration of wireless services. The World Bank has published countless studies on how crippling it is to the growth of, a, of, a, of, a, of an economy when wireless services are not competitive and ubiquitous. The entrenched oligopoly of the big three in wire and wireless in Canada, Bell, Telus, and Rogers, had little motivation to innovate new products and services and offer businesses and consumers in Canada a cost-effective alternative in wireless so that all consumers and businesses can take full advantage of wireless communications. I personally, at the time, had a Rogers bill of over $1,000 a month as I was traveling across Canada to build mobile app. So we founded Global Eye Wireless in 2008 with the goal of bringing a true independent choice in wireless to Canadians. While we knew we had a great market opportunity, we also knew that the big three would not give up their oligopoly, their cozy oligopoly easily. We received no positive responses from Canadian investors of all sizes and kinds in entering the, to enter, help us enter the upcoming auction. Hundreds of rejections from Canadian investors. We were encouraged to stick to our knitting. Go home and be happy with your little global life company. Don't think you can compete with the big guys. We were told the risk was way too great, that the dominance of the big three was simply insurmountable. In fact, in one investor presentation, I was told I was suicidal to be considering going up against the big three wireless carriers and that the successful business we had built would be crushed by the big three when we began competing directly with them. 
When I was asked if I was suicidal, I took my favorite line from the film Ocean's Eleven, for those that know it, when Matt Damon asked Brad Pitt if he's a suicidal. And Brad Pitt's answer is, only in the mornings. The meeting was at 10 a.m. <laughs> Undeterred, we looked abroad for capital to fund our new wireless venture. I traveled personally around the world to find a strategic partner where they would have the investment horizon, the staying power, and the expertise to help us launch Canada's fourth national carrier. And our proposition was simple. Well, we had no experience in wireless, we, and we need substantial capital to build our own independent network and distribution pl platform. We do have an award-winning team and a strong track record of producing results and strong Canadian market knowledge. This combined with the fact that the Canadian market was the least competitive, as I said, with the highest prices and lowest penetration of all developed countries, made for a very compelling proposition to international strategic investors. After countless rejections abroad, I finally secured what was initially a 15-minute meeting with now one of my friends and mentors, Mr. Naguib Suarez. He invited me to, after the 15-minute meeting, which I flew 20 hours to get to, <laughs> economy in the back in the middle. <laughs> uh, Mr. Swears invited me uh, for dinner and our partnership was formed to start Global Life Wireless. In 2009, what then, what was at the time just a murmur of debate, developed into a firestorm over whether Global Life was in compliance with the Canadian telecommunications regulations. Was Globalife Canadian enough under the regulations to become a fourth national carrier? This is when I got my lesson in never underestimating your competitor. I completely underestimated the power of the big three companies to lobby the CRTC successfully and convince them to hold the first ever in the history of our country telecom public hearing review of a telecom company and ultimately the big three convinced the CRTC to side with them and deny Win Mobile our operating license. We had already built the network. We had already hired almost 1,000 people. We had already built over 100 stores, and we were ready to launch. And the big three, the power of the big three, I got my heart lesson in how just how strong they are. And those were some very challenging times for my company. And it was, I must say, those old themes of perseverance, discipline, and focus of our leadership team that kept our team motivated when the entire future of our, our new venture was cast in doubt. After two months of a scramble to prove we were compliant with the regulations in December of 2009, the federal government intervened and buried the CRTC decision in an unprecedented move to permit our launch. And we were launching WinMobile as Canada's first new wireless carrier, independent, completely in the structure of the big three in well over a decade. But our challenges were far from over, and since then, over the past three years, I fought a legal battle that escalated all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and was finally, just this spring, dismissed. And we were victorious in our operating license secured. I'm really proud of what we've achieved with Wynn, and today, among you today, we have a few customers. We have almost half a million customers across Canada now. We're, our network covers almost 13 million Canadians, uh, and we're bringing prices and wireless down. We've brought prices down almost 20% already in the markets we operate. All of you, when you go into a Bell Telus or Rogers store, just let them know you're gonna switch to Wynn, <laughs> and you'll see, you'll see the types of deals you can get. Of course, I prefer you come to Wynn, but. If you really want to get a good deal from Rogers, tell them you're switching to win. <laughs> We're forcing the big three to improve their service levels and their costs. And now our partnership with Arascom Telecom has evolved into a strategic partnership with international telecom giant Vimplecom, with over 200 million customers around the world. We're taking all the best practices from all the markets they operate in around the world, all the countries they operate in, to bring the best in wireless to Canadians.
One question I get asked frequently is, how do you finance a startup? How do you finance a startup when you have no track record and no credibility? And maybe, as in my case, none of your own resources from family and yourself. Uh, there's no one answer to that question, but every startup is different. Firstly, whatever your plans are for a social enterprise or a for-profit, set realistic objectives for, for growth, for profitability, for sales, whatever your metrics are, whatever your goals are, set realistic objectives. The smart, sophisticated investors will know what is achievable and what is not, and you will quickly lose all credibility to start with if you set unrealistic goals. Prove your business model with a modest initial investment and give investors the opportunity to participate with you as you grow. Investors always like the opportunity to see something work before much risk is taken. And when things are bad, always tell your investors the whole complete truth. I live by that principle even today. Even today I live by that principle and I'm, even though I'm able to invest myself in businesses now, I still always tell all of my investors exactly what's going on and when things are bad, it's when you share the most information. The history of global life is financing. I've always been asked, how did, it, how did it come to be that you raised almost two billion in capital for wind? And the answer is, again, not one, it may be one that's disappointing because it's actually very simple. It's actually very simple. We started Global Live with a small business loan from the Royal Bank of $50,000. We started paying the Royal Bank back and we got another business loan for $200,000. We started paying that loan back and I asked the Royal, the Royal Bank agent to introduce me to a group of angel investors and I was able to get a million dollars of financing from the angel investors. I paid those investors back and I was able to get four million of financing from a group that inter that, that inter group introduced me to. And then I was able in 2004 to raise the last equity financing that I'd done for Globalize for another four million dollars after I'd clearly shown the returns to those initial equity investors. And then in 2006, I raised 75 million dollars of debt to acquire Yak Communications. And when I went to speak with Mr. Suarez about financing wind, in 2008, I had already paid down half of that bank debt. The story is so simple for engineers to understand. If you take money from investors, your priority must be to show the returns and pay them back. If you take money for your charitable cause, your, your priority must be to show your sponsors and your donors where their money is going to work and how their money is going to help people. And when you do that, you not only establish a lot more credibility for yourself, but you can grow from $50,000 in financing to $2 billion in financing. So my last bit of advice, and then I'll look forward to all your questions. Where do you start? Where do you start? Firstly, I believe that the most important thing you can do in life, whether you pursue, pursue social causes, social entrepreneurship, public or private sector work, it's your personal network, your personal community of colleagues, friends, mentors, partners, associates, and acquaintances that are the single biggest asset you have. That's the single most important thing to you. Make sure you spend time. Make sure you spend time developing all the relationships you have and meet as many people as you can. And I'm not gonna let you off easy this morning. We're gonna start that right now. So I'd like everyone to introduce themselves to someone around them they don't already know and find out one interesting thing about that person. <laughs>
Okay, this is uh, fantastic to see. I mean, I know it was boring to listen to, but... Uh, saw some fantastic interactions. I actually think I saw one gentleman not trying to actually meet the girl beside him for, uh, so, <laughs> for social reasons, much more than business reasons. Uh, that was great. <laughs> It was great to see so many people pulled out their mobile phones and exchanged uh, info. That was fantastic. You know, that never could happen uh, when I was sitting here in 1993. You had to write down everyone's info. It's great to see. Don't forget to do that every single day you're at the University of Toronto. It's the most important thing for you to do. Secondly, I have spent a great deal of my time and my career developing and learning from mentors, developing relationships with and learning from mentors. I now count some of the most prominent world-leading entrepreneurs and philanthropists as my mentors. And to this day, I continue to learn something every single day from all the people I interact with, my work colleagues, my friends, my acquaintances, my friends, my family. I continue to have an open mind to learn. Humility and a willingness to see things from others' perspectives are essential ingredients for success, however you define success. Thirdly, set realistic goals, and when you achieve them, take a moment to enjoy the victory. Life goes by very, very, very quickly. Take it from a 38-year-old guy who thinks, still thinks he's 20, 18. Uh, well, since we're all engineers in here, we can do the math on this. So let's use round numbers and say that everyone in here lives to 100 years old. But you really can't do anything intelligent until you're 10, unless you're being so I can dig a trench and get under my neighbor's fence. You really can't do anything until you're 10. And you really, hopefully, have the opportunity to enjoy life a little bit and relax when you're 80. So you have 70 years. 70 years is only, can anyone tell me how many days? 25,000 or so days. 25,000 days. That's all you have to do everything that you want to do. 25,000 days is all that we short-lived, weakling humans are allotted. 25,000 days. If, you, if anyone in here is a Star Wars fan like myself, it makes the uh, 800 years that Yoda has very, uh, I'm very envious of Yoda. <laughs> Let's continue with the math, because you only have 24 hours in a day. So seven years, you only have 600,000 hours. 600,000 hours is all you have in your 70 years. And unfortunately, because humans are so weak, we need to sleep for a third of the time. So really, you only have 400,000 hours that you're actually awake to do something productive and pursue your dreams and goals. Does it make you regret spending an hour with me right now? <laughs> you can never get this hour back. One of the 400,000 is gone. Your time as an undergraduate at the University of Toronto in junior school is four years, and it's about eight months a year for four years. That's only about a thousand days. It's only a thousand days. This is one of a thousand days. <laughs> a lot of dates or a lot of time you're spending here? <laughs> the two weeks associated with orientation is uh, actually about 1% of your entire undergraduate career. The point is really simple. You must value your time. You must value your time every minute of every day, cherish your relationships with your family and friends, and make every single minute of every day count. Life is shockingly short. And for all of us in this room that count, Arithmetic is one of our gifts. Uh, maybe in this case it's a curse more than a gift. We all really understand how finite time is. <laughs> Lastly, last lesson I've learned. If something sounds too good to be true, the expression, the age-old expression, that it probably is, is absolutely correct. If something looks and smells too good to be true, and a business opportunity, and a social opportunity, 
social enterprise opportunity for a charitable cause, it probably is too good to be true if it looks it. I've seen countless business plans that say they're the next Google, the next Twitter, the next Instagram. In fact, the only successful businesses that I've ever interacted with are ones that have real, realistic goals and objectives. And in fact, realistic goals and objectives doesn't mean you don't have the next Twitter, or Google, or Instagram. It just means that you, with good planning and execution, you have a real shot of becoming one of those companies. Keep your eye on your long-term goal, and no matter what happens, make those course corrections along the way to achieve your goals. Set realistic goals so that you have a real chance of making something big. I want to share with you one weakness I have. It's been the most crippling weakness I've had in my career. And I still have figured out, I've not figured out how to conquer it. But I think it transcends all entrepreneurs that I've met. All, all, all entrepreneurs, social and for-profit entrepreneurs, all have this problem. I fall in love with an idea, and I will never let it go. And I've gotten myself into some really stupid business ventures, where I've lost all my money and all my time. And right looking back today, time is more important to me than money. I've lost all my time and money because I was so stubborn, I refused to accept that the idea that I had was just a bad one, just stupid. I just, just not gonna work. It's really important that you maintain the humility and the openness to see when your idea needs to be modified, changed, developed, to make changes when you work with your partners, your friends, your colleagues, when you're sharing work in engineering. There are many ways to solve problems. Maintain an open mind for the next four years as you meet as many people as you can and learn as much as you can from them and there's always many ways to solve a problem. And if your idea is not the best one, have the strength to admit it is not the best one. <laughs> Looking around the room, I know I see, as I said earlier, some of the great future leaders of our country. I'm very excited for you. I'm very envious of you. I wish I was in your chair again with everything I know now would be ideal. <laughs> uh, but regardless, you have a wonderful journey ahead of you, and I am very excited for your future and your prospects, and I look forward to hearing some great stories of success. Congratulations, good luck. Obviously, you have no foundation to do anything with someone if there isn't trust. So, on one level, I would say it's the most important thing in a relationship. Obviously, it's the most important thing in a personal relationship. It's the most important thing in a marriage. It's the most important thing. Uh, it's the most important thing on that level. But what I'd say also is that as you develop relationships outside of your family and friends, and as you develop your charity or your social cause or your, your business, as you develop those ideas, it's very important to work with people that you know and you trust and you like. I would say, though, that it's very important also that you ensure that your own interests are, being, are not being compromised to satisfy that trust. So make sure that you are working with people that are of like mind, 
make sure that you are working with people that have similar values, goals, objectives, whatever, whatever metrics you want to put to your venture. Make sure those people are aligned with you, otherwise there's always going to be stress and strain on the trust. That's what I would say. Why did you choose to start a wireless communications company? Uh, like I'm suicidal, remember? I chose to start a wireless communications company because I had built a business to a size uh, in, that was too big for comfort for the big guys in Canada. So by 2006, 2007, the Global Act Group was just too big for comfort and the big guys, I needed to either sell the company to the big guys because they were putting so much pressure on us, marketing pressure, infrastructure pressure, etc. They were putting so much pressure because we were becoming a problem for them that I had to either sell the company or find a strategic partner and go big. And uh, the opportunity I saw was to go big. So we, we and, and get off of using all the infrastructure from the phone companies and build our own infrastructure, our own towers, our own antennas, our own core switches, and do everything independent of the big three, which we are now doing today. Why did you choose to come to U of T instead of Queens? Queens. <laughs> or, or, or Waterloo. Come on. Who asked this question? I need to know who asked this question. <laughs> or Ryerson. <Ryerson. laughs> You're at the best place to be in this country. Enjoy every minute of it. ads and excessive lobbying of the big three. <laughs> These questions are like made for me. <laughs> Whenever someone is afraid that the status quo will change, they do crazy things. We're putting real substantial pressure on the way things have been for the past 30 years. Wireless infrastructure started in this country in 1984. In 1984. And you know what? Rogers and Bell were given their wireless license by the government at the time. We paid $450 million for our license. They were given their license for free in the mid-80s. They have built their business over the past 30 years and formed a true, perfect oligopoly. In fact, on a provincial level, they're operating as duopolies. Telus and Rogers in the West, and Bell and Rogers in the East. Now, all the brands you see in the market, I'm sure all of you I've done your research and know this, but Kudo, Fido, Solo, Virgin, Chatter, those are all owned 100% by Bell, Telus, or Rogers. And Bell and Telus share one network. So they're only they're operating as one wireless company, which is why I call them Bellus all the time in the media. They get very upset. <laughs> the answer is, I think the manipulative ads and excessive lobbying are what you should expect any time you challenge the status quo and you get the attention of the big guys. So I hope all of you are in, end up in the same position I was in. Because that means you're doing something productive. How important were, you, were your written and spoken communication skills in your career? I would say, um, obviously, I'm talking to you here today having done, I don't know, I, have, I don't speak as frequently as uh, professors do, but I speak all the time. So it's easy for me at this point to stand up here and. And, and that speech I think I wrote, I don't know how, it's not taking very long. So your skills will develop as you use them. The key is, and one of the things you can do by meeting people all the time and talking to people all the time, is those skills will develop on their own. The more you talk in front of groups of three, of five, the more you talk in your study groups and you're the one developing your communication skills by being the one talking. The more you do that, the more you will build up to where today it's easy and natural for me to speak to all of you. So I didn't start with it. I built it and developed it over time. <clears throat> what is the most important tip for future entrepreneurs? Well, I mean, were you listening? I gave you five. <laughs> we, okay, you know, I gotta say the whole speech again. <laughs> what is the most important tip for future entrepreneurs? You all met one new person today. The most important tip I have is to meet as many people as you can and enjoy every 
experience you have here in developing these relationships. Colleagues, acquaintances, friends, work associates, study groups, and many as many. And you now have many more tools than I had. There was no mobile phones when I was here in 19, I didn't have a cell phone in 1993. I, there was no, obviously, no social media. So you have the opportunity, you have many more tools at your disposal than, than I had in my in, when I was here. I still think the best thing is good old fashioned getting together and talking to people. So, you know, make yourself a regular at the cafes, the local cafes and pubs, and, and meet as many people as you can. What are your future plans for wind? My future plans for wind is that wind will be the third Rogers Bellis wind. The third largest wireless carrier in the world. How did you meet connections to pursue your business plan? I met those people. I met the first people that still work at Global Live, as I said, Johnny Crada, uh, Peter Spinato, Anthony Cozy. These are all graduates from U of T, UC. I met them all while I was here, uh, and they continue to work with me today. The colleagues and friends and trust I developed with those people while working to pass uh, to get through engineering school here sticks with me today. So I met uh, those people initially, and then from there, every time I developed a customer relationship, I made sure I had a connection with that person, and I tried to see what else that could lead to. So I was always thinking of you know, ecosystems of people, and how do I broaden my network as fast as I can. Uh, and all of you started it today by meeting someone, so you're on the, on the right track. If there was one thing that you could have done differently, what would it be? Okay, well firstly, I'm not a person that believes in regret. I, I think that regret is one of the most negative emotions you can have. If you ever feel regret coming over yourself, you need to look in the mirror and ask what the source is and you need to kill it. Regret is a very dangerous emotion. So, I made tons of mistakes over my career. I make mistakes still today. Today I parked illegally. <laughs> so you'll make mistakes every single day and, uh, of your life and I think that that's okay. I think that it's a good thing um, and I don't, I don't think that there's any problem uh, with that. Are we done? We are done. Thank you very much for It's uh, my privilege to thank Tony, and I, I've got to say, I, I just met someone new today, Fantastic. and wonderful, thank and you. I don't know how many of the 400,000 hours, I haven't calculated, I've used up, but I've got to tell you, it was a wonderful one hour, and I know you all share that, so please, thanks. Thank you. Yes, I, I will switch to wind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.